Our scripture this morning comes from the Gospel of Mark, uh, chapter 2, starting at verse 1. A few days later, when Jesus again entered Capernaum, the people heard that he had come home. So many gathered that there was no room left, not even outside the door, and he preached the word to them. Some men came, bringing to him a paralytic, carried by four of them. Since they could not get him, get him to Jesus because of the crowd, they made an opening in the roof above Jesus, and after digging through it, lowered the mat the paralyzed man was lying on. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, son, your sins are forgiven. Now some teachers of the law were sitting there thinking to themselves, why does this fellow talk like that? He's blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? Immediately, Jesus knew in his spirit that this was what they were thinking in their hearts. And he said to them, why are you thinking these things? Which is easier, to say to the paralytic, your sins are forgiven, or to say, get up, take your mat, and walk? But that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, he said to the paralytic, I tell you, get up, take your mat, and go home. He got up, took his mat, and walked out in full view of them all. This amazed everyone, and they praised God, saying, We have never seen anything like this. This is the word of God for us this morning. A couple weeks ago, our family was off on vacation. We went up to the Black Hills in South Dakota and uh, had a wonderful time. We stayed in little cabins on campgrounds most of the time. And one of the things that we do on vacation is, is not really watch much TV, especially if you're in a cabin without one. Uh, it's kind of hard to, but we don't watch TV. We, we're not online, so we kind of miss out on a lot of the news and the things going on out in the world. You know, we're just focused on what's right in front of us. And so you come back to the real world, and you start to learn what had happened while you were gone. And uh, one of the things that happened while we were gone was the NFL season started with its preseason games. And I didn't even realize that things had started and everything until we got back. We got back Thursday night, so Friday morning I was in the basement getting ready uh, for the day, and Jameis and I were down there, and I turned on ESPN and saw highlights of a preseason football game from the night before. And I'm like, Jameson, and knowing that he doesn't care, uh, it's the, the first highlights that we've seen of the NFL season. The, the season has started. I didn't know if that was too common. You make a better door than a window. Uh, And I was thinking of that saying as I looked at this passage in the Gospel of Mark. Uh, It's it's an amazing, wonderful passage, and I want us to dig into it a little bit this morning. Uh, It's the second chapter of Mark, so it's right at the beginning of the Gospel. And it's interesting that Mark really wants us to catch on to this idea that, that Jesus was healing people that he had this power to heal, and and that drew crowds. And so as Jesus is in this house, a crowd is gathering around him, and they're just filling the house to overflowing. So if you can imagine in your mind uh, one of those old, just kind of box-shaped, square clay houses. Jesus is in there talking. The the room is full. There's not really any windows, so everyone is pressing in on the door on the outside. They're trying to just catch a glimpse or or just to hear something that Jesus is speaking as he shares the word of God uh, with those that have gathered there. And, and along come five friends, and they're coming because they've heard about that healing power. If you look at Mark Goss, or Mark's chapter 1, he's already healed a man with an evil spirit. He's already healed somebody that had leprosy, and it says that crowds were coming with all the people that were sick, and Jesus was touching them and healing them. And so these five friends have come looking for that healing touch because one of their friends is paralyzed. He's a paralytic. 
And it doesn't tell us how long he's been paralyzed, if it was something that he was born with or if there's an accident along the way, but uh, he's paralyzed. And these four friends grab the four corners of his mat and have carried him to have him meet Jesus. And as they get there, they notice the crowd is, is coming out the door, and, and I see these four guys being bold enough to just walk up to the door and like, excuse us, paralyzed man coming through, you know, and trying to just push their way into the crowd, but nobody's moving. I don't know if they can't or they won't, but nobody's letting them in to get to Jesus. And so we don't know exactly what happened next, but my imagination kind of says they, they set their friend down, and one of them said, you know, I'm going to look for another entrance. And he started walking around the house that Jesus was in. And as he went around the corner, he saw some stairs. You see, these old houses, um, they had a flat roof that they would access by stairs on the outside of the house. And so when he sees the stairs, he's like, ah, I got an idea. And goes back, he says, guys, grab the mat, let's go. And takes them upstairs to the roof. And uh, they're like, what are we going to do next? I think this house needs a skylight, don't you? And they start banging on the ground, and they start digging through the roof. It would have been made of some, some big timber, Uh, wood beams that were across, and then probably like palm branches laid across that, and then some clay pounded down on top of that. So they start digging into the clay, and they get down to the wood beams. They find the opening in the wood beams. They open it up, and they start to lower their friend down uh, right in front of Jesus. And as that happens, I'm picturing the crowd below. Uh, They're probably not too excited about what's going on upstairs, and it probably starts with just a little dust from the ceiling, you know, falling down, and they start looking, and I'm sure there was a commotion in the midst of that crowd thinking maybe the the house is collapsing on them or something, you know, and then it opens up, and this paralyzed man comes down, and we would all think they go, ooh, and ah, you know, what great faith, but I bet they were yelling, I bet they were mad, these guys are budging, they're cutting in line, you know, to get up there to Jesus, they probably were not pleased with it, Uh, but Jesus looks at them, and and said he saw their faith, And then he says, your sins are forgiven to the paralyzed man. Now, my guess is that's not why he came to see Jesus, right? He didn't come looking to get his sins forgiven. He came looking to be healed. But when Jesus says your sins are forgiven, he's showing something about who he is, that he has authority, that he is the son of God and he can forgive sins. But it says that it it bothered the crowd. It frustrated the crowd that was gathered there. There were some teachers of the law, and they were frustrated by what Jesus was saying. Now, one thing I noticed here, do you notice who was keeping this paralyzed man from Jesus? It was a bunch of religious people, wasn't it? Teachers of the law. It was people that were wanting to learn more about God. They were blocking the paralyzed man from getting to Jesus until his friends found another way uh, to get in there. But uh, Jesus hears their, their murmuring within their hearts because they, they believe only God can forgive sins. And, and he hears that, so he speaks to that. And he says, what's easier to say? Your sins are forgiven or get up and walk. I mean, think about it. If someone says your sins are forgiven, you can't really see anything happen, right? We don't see sins just dissolve away or anything like that. It'd be much more difficult to say to someone that's paralyzed, get up and walk, because they better get up and walk or you've lost all credibility, right? You've lost your authority if you say that and it doesn't happen. And so he's like, it's, it's a lot easier to say your sins are forgiven, uh, which I can do, but he says, I also can say get up and walk. And so he turns to the paralyzed man and he says, get up, take your mat, and go home. And I'm sure the paralyzed man paused as he heard those words. He'd probably been told to get up before, hadn't he? I bet many people yelled at him, just get up, get out of the way. But this time it was different, because he could never respond before. He couldn't get up. But this time he, he puts his hands down and begins to push up, and his feet tighten, his legs have strength as he stands in front of Jesus. He bends over and and rolls up his mat and tucks it under his arm, and I'm sure he turned towards the door with a huge smile on his face, and the crowd that wouldn't let him in now begins to part as he walks out the front door. And it says they all were amazed. They'd never seen anything like this, and and they praised God. They celebrate. I'm sure those four friends up on the roof are running down around to the side to meet him as he comes out the front door. Just an amazing scene of of healing taking place in, in this man's life. And this is one of the passages our kids looked at in, in vacation Bible school. And uh, I could probably preach, preach 10 different messages, I think, on this, because there's so much going on. Um, but I know our kids focused on the care of those four friends, that this man that was paralyzed had four friends that cared enough to carry him to Jesus. And then even to, they cared enough to tear a hole in someone else's house uh, to get him to Jesus. They really cared courageously and, and boldly for this man in order for him to be healed. But what I want to notice a little bit is um, just how this man was healed. 
Uh, the first thing that I, that I noticed as he was lowered down in front of Jesus and as Jesus offered forgiveness, did you see why Jesus offered forgiveness? Uh, it's in verse 5. If we can have verse 5 up again. When Jesus saw their faith, he offered forgiveness. Did you notice that? It's not when he saw his faith. It's not just about the paralyzed man. I hope he had faith, although I was thinking, you know, he wouldn't even have had to have faith because he, it's not like he could get away from his four friends. If they had faith, he was going to be healed. They could have said, yeah, run away. We're taking you, you know. He could have been taken uh, against his will. I believe he probably had faith and probably uh, believed, but it wasn't just his faith that Jesus was looking at. He said when Jesus saw their faith, the faith of the five friends, that is what made him, that caused him to offer that forgiveness and then that healing. And so it was a reminder to me that, that our faith impacts the people around us, doesn't it? Our faith impacts the people around us. That we are called to, to believe in each other. We're called to believe for one another. We need to be connected in, in our faith. And, and when we have that faith with and, and for one another, uh, amazing things can happen. And, and I've always kind of been of the, um, the mindset that, yeah, I want my faith to impact people. And, and I want to be a window, basically. I, I want people to see my faith or, you know, the actions that I do, the words I say, the the, the thoughts I have, I want all of those things to, to be a window where people can look through and they can see it's not me, it's Jesus living in me. That's what I want my life to be, is, is a window for people to see Jesus. Um, and then they can know him by seeing him in my life. And, and I thought, that's good, that's a good thing for us to be a window. But I was taken back to that saying I had at the very beginning that was in my mind, you make a better door than a window. And so I was challenged to, to not just be a window, because a window, you know, it's, it's up to them to see through me, right? It's their responsibility to see faith in me, and their responsibility to then, you know, do something about that. But I was challenged to not just be a window, but I would make a better door. I was being challenged by God to not just sit back and, and be a window, but to be a, a way to Jesus, that I might have the boldness to, to create a way like these friends did. They had vision to see, well, the door is blocked, but we're going to make another door. We're going to find another pathway to God. And for us to be people that will be a doorway to Christ for others. That we don't just sit back and, and say, just look through me, but say, hey, come and see. Be bold enough to invite someone to a relationship with Christ. Invite someone to get closer to God. Invite someone to be a part of a, a community of faith. That's harder to do, isn't it? It's harder to be a window or a door than it is a window. It's harder to open ourselves up and say, uh, this is the way. I invite you to come with me, to, to join me as we draw closer to God. But I think that's the challenge God was laying on my heart, was to not just be a window, but to be a better door, be a better pathway to invite people to Christ. And actually, someone after the first service, they mentioned to me also, doors can be shut. And sometimes we choose to shut that door. When someone is searching for faith, they're looking for a connection, and we shut the door. Um, just like the religious people in that case shut the door to him at first. Sometimes we choose to do that. But we need to open ourselves up and be willing to go and invite and, and draw people closer to Christ. Now, that might mean for you that there's someone that you need to be a pathway to Christ, a doorway to Christ, that you need to uh, you know, share some scripture with them, read the Bible with them, invite them to do, to do that together, just maybe the two of you. Uh, do that together, or pray for them, or pray with them, or, or maybe it is to invite them um, to be a part of our faith community, to be bold enough to say, hey, come and, come and join us as we learn and grow about our faith together, and especially in a few weeks as our fall things kind of kick off, it's a great time uh, to be that doorway, to make that invitation, say, hey, we're going to be focusing on Family 101, we're going to be focusing on how to connect with one another, and why don't you join me on Sunday mornings? as we, we gather together. Or maybe that's not something that, uh, that's a, a place that's maybe blocked, and that's not a great pathway. You say, you know what? How about just come on Wednesday night? We have a supper, and then we go to a little small group, and, and we talk about what God's doing in our lives and how we connect with one another. Maybe that's the, the doorway, the pathway you might offer to somebody and invite them through. Or maybe it's you recognize their care for ministry, and you say, well, why don't you come with me and, and we can host some people as they come to our attic, our clothes closet. As they look for clothes and stuff, we can host them and, and take care of them. Or, or maybe you want to be a part of our backpack program where we put together food to, to go to the kids at the school that, that need some food over the weekend. Um, maybe you invite them to be a part of a ministry. And that's a pathway, a doorway for them to get closer to God. 
Uh, I was challenged by this, this passage to not just settle for being a window. It's a good thing to be a window. It's a good thing to show Christ in our life and people to see that. But maybe we need to go a little further and, and be a better door that we can open up and invite, encourage, and, and draw people, show them where Christ is, and allow him then, then to touch them, to care for them, to pour out his love and grace upon them. I felt that challenge, and, and I offer that challenge to you too. Find a way to, to be a door. Be someone that can lead someone and, and help someone in the relationship to Christ. Um, just yesterday, I was reading an article uh, I found online. It was talking about young people and their relationship to Christ and uh, talking about how so many young people, when they are in church, as, when, as young people, they're in youth group and those kind of things, and then they go off to college, and, and they feel like, well, I've graduated from youth group, right? I've graduated from church, and so they leave the Christian church. They just don't know how to connect as adults. And um, I, th I think that's very true. We see this in youth ministry, that especially like confirmation year, seventh and eighth grade, you have big numbers of, of kids participating. Then after that, just kind of slowly, fewer and fewer, because there's so many things going on and all that kind of stuff. Um, and then as college goes, you know, fewer and fewer are connected. And what it was offering, this, this article, was that if five adults would care for one youth, five adults would kind of be, show interest, would, would care for uh, these young people would be a doorway for them, then they have much higher chances of then connecting with a church as adults. Now, I don't know all the, they said they've looked at research and that's what kind of has shown to them, but I, I, you know, I'm just learning about this myself. But it says if five adults will show up at their ball games, we'll ask them how things are going, we'll check in with them from time to time, it encourages them that you can be an adult and have faith and this is what it looks like. And it's a doorway that helps them and, and keeps their faith going uh, into college and beyond. And so it's challenging me as I think of our youth ministry, challenging me as I think of my own kids, and I want people to connect with them as well, but just reminding me how much, how important it is for us to be doorways for one another to faith. Now we can't live our faith just on our own. We can't think, I'll just be a window and I'll leave it up to other people to ask me questions. I'll, I'll leave it to them to, to see these things in me, but we have to become bold enough to invite people, to ask them questions, to, to say, hey, come with me. Come and see and, and take interest in them and care for them as God does. And so the challenge to me and the challenge to you is to be a better door than a window. Be willing to invite and, and open up and share the love of Christ with those around you that, that need a church home, that need a place to connect and, and hear about God's love and grace. Make those invitations. Be a, an open door. Let us pray. Gracious God, we thank you that this paralytic man had four friends willing to carry him to you. Lord, people have probably carried each and every one of us at different times in our lives, and I ask that you help us to, to be a doorway, to be a path that someone might be led closer to you, maybe to meet you for the first time, or maybe just to be strengthened and, and be drawn more into your arms of love and grace. Uh, whatever it is, Lord, help us to, to be mindful that we can be windows and we can show your faith in our lives, that people can see you through us but also to take that next step and, and to be a better door that is open, inviting, and welcoming and drawing them closer to you. Lord, use us as, as your people. We pray this all in Jesus' holy and precious name.